cabbage surgery. Is it just another bread and butter cardiac surgery to be done? What if I told you that there's more you can offer your patients using TEE during these surgeries than you may realize? I'll explain more in this episode of Tea Time. Welcome to Tea Time. I'm your host, Dr. Andreas Plakis, and we are going to talk about TEE for cabbage surgery in a two-part series. The clinical question that we're going to answer is what must clinicians know to best perform TEE during coronary artery bypass graft surgery or cabbage surgery? I mentioned these episodes will be in two parts covering cabbage surgery. Part one will be the assessment of LV function and wall motion abnormalities. And then part two will be valvular assessment with cabbage surgery and also post MI mechanical complications and how we manage those. So today will be simply the assessment of LV function in various ways that include the Simpsons biplane method of discs, 3D quantification, and also the regional assessment of the left ventricle and assessing wall motion abnormalities. It's important to know some of the differences between indications for cabbage surgery versus PCI. When we look at this list, some of the things that make cabbage more preferable to PCI include left main coronary artery disease, especially if there's high complexity, or multi-vessel, or three-vessel disease uh, with a high syntax score. And you can look at the figure on the right side of the screen that explains some of the features uh, that go into the syntax score, but it's basically a grading system used to quantify the complexity of coronary artery disease and possibly indicate the difficulty of revascularizing purely with PCI. So there's a number of factors that interventional cardiologists use here. Other features that make cabbage more preferable include multivessel disease with diabetic patients, very complex coronary artery disease that may not be amenable to PCI, failed prior PCI, such as when you have instant restenosis, or a patient that has an inability to tolerate dual antiplatelet therapy. Oftentimes, STEMI or high-risk and STEMI, primary PCI is appropriate to treat the culprit lesion. However, we may prefer cabbage at times when there's failed PCI and there's a large area of the myocardium at risk, or if the patient's not a PCI candidate, and also if there's mechanical complications such as acute mitral regurgitation or LV free wall rupture. Also, just to round it out, PCI is typically more preferable in single-vessel disease or two-vessel disease with low anatomic complexity. We went over some of this information in episode two where we talked about the indications for TEE, but it's specific to cabbage surgery. Just to review in the 2010 ASA guidelines, the language was that it should be considered especially in high-risk cabbage cases. And in the 2013 ASC guidelines, it's to be used in some coronary artery bypass graft surgeries. One of the main papers that I cited was this paper from the Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2021 that was over many years, over a thousand centers, over a million patients that essentially looked at isolated cabbage procedures, both with and without intraoperative TEE. And some of the key findings from that paper were that in high risk cabbage patients, the use of TEE significantly improved outcomes, whereas in low risk cabbage patients, there was minimal outcome benefits seen. Based on these findings, the evidence was strongly support the use of TEE to improve outcomes in cabbage patients, especially in the high-risk cabbage patients, but would be a little bit more equivocal in the low-risk cabbage patients. We'll start our conversation about TEE for cabbage surgery by looking at the left ventricle. A few factors to look at are the left ventricular anatomy that includes the shape and size and also the wall thickness of the ventricle. And then specifically related to function, we're going to look at both global and regional function of the left ventricle. As far as global left ventricular function, there's three tests that I use in an operating room that I find to be most clinically relevant. I'll go over each one of these, but the eyeball test, Simpson's biplane method of discs, and 3D quantification. The eyeball test is something that a lot of providers use when they're in a hurry or just to briefly assess left ventricular function periodically throughout the case. If you test yourself and perform this way and then measure quantitatively, most people that are pretty good at doing this get within 5% of the actual measured left ventricular ejection fraction. And because of this range of error, we'll frequently report a range such as I listed here, LVEF from 30 to 40%, as you may be slightly off and it's not a measured number. But most of the 
assessment here is done based on this formula that EF is the end diastolic volume, the image on the left, versus the end systolic volume, that image in the middle, over the end diastolic volume. Essentially, what's the fraction that's ejected from the heart? And that's how we, at a very basic level, do the eyeball test. We look at more accurate and more quantitative ways to assess global left ventricular function. First one to look at is the Simpsons biplane method of discs. Based on the 2015 ASC recommendations for chamber quantification, I'll read this verbatim, but the most commonly used method for 2D echocardiographic volume calculations is the biplane method of disc summation or the modified Simpsons rule, which is the recommended 2D echocardiographic method by consensus of this committee. And you can see based on the picture that we're essentially adding up the volumes of discs that help provide measurements of the left ventricle and that the summation of these discs gives us the global volumes both in end diastole and end systole and that's how we can calculate the ejection fraction walking you through step by step how to actually do this we're going to get two views of the heart the mid esophageal four chamber the mid esophageal two chamber make sure those images are clear and you can identify the endocardial borders and we'll acquire sine loops of both of these once they're acquired using the simpsons biplane software we'll actually trace the endocardium in both end systole and end diastole of each of those views, excluding papillary muscles, avoiding foreshortening, which can give you inaccurate measurements. And doing such will give you an end diastolic volume and an end systolic volume using both those zero and 90 degree planes. And once you have the EDV and the ESV, then they'll calculate the ejection fraction using that formula that we already went over. So this is a quick and usually pretty easy way to assess left ventricular ejection fraction using 2D methods. Another way that we can assess global left ventricular function is with 3D quantification. Benefits to this is that it's unaffected by foreshortening. There's also no geometric assumption here. And what I mean by that is because in 2D, when you're measuring at 0 degrees and 90 degrees, you have to assume the structure of the rest of the left ventricle from 0 to 90 degrees. Whereas in 3D quantification, because you're getting a three-dimensional data set, you're actually measuring all of that area so there's no assumption here so from that those same ASC chamber quantification guidelines from 2015 what they mention here is that in patients with good quality images 3d echocardiographic measurements are accurate and reproducible and should therefore be used when available and feasible so recommended again by the committee here I want to take you through an example of how to actually acquire this and how to perform it this video goes quickly so feel free to pause it rewind it but it will take you through the steps of how to actually perform 3D quantification on a Phillips system. You'll start by acquiring a full volume four to six beat loop. Then you'll press the 3D QA or advantage button. You'll find your N diastolic frame, align that yellow arrow through the mid LV through the left ventricular septum and align your NPR planes from LV apex to base. There's five reference points that mark the mitral annulus points and also the apex of the LV that then produce an outline of the LV. You'll make any corrections to this if needed. And then you'll repeat the process with the end systolic frame and finding those five end systolic reference points again. When everything looks good, you'll hit sequence analysis. And this will produce the image that can give you the actual information about the global left ventricular ejection fraction, specific regional wall motion abnormalities. And here you can look at very specific segments and walls to see if there are any abnormalities and get a very specific calculated ejection fraction. Since we've covered three ways to go over global left ventricular function, there are a couple ways that we can look at regional assessment of the LV or wall motion abnormalities. First, we define wall motion or wall thickening as normal thickening is a greater than 30% increase in thickness. Hypokinesis would be a 10 to 30% increase in thickness, whereas akinesis would be less than 10% increase in thickening. We don't often measure these in the operating room, so typically I look at it as normal, means it moves normally. Hypokinesis means something looks wrong and it's not moving normally, and akinesis means it's not moving at all. That's typically a more clinically relevant way to think about it. There's two other ways we can look at wall motion, and that's dyskinesis, where it actually thins during systole with outward movement during systole. This can occur in infarcted or aneurysmal tissue. And we contrast this with paradoxical motion, which still thickens during systole, but moves outward instead of inward during systole. And this can be indicative of a left bundle branch block, RV pacing, PVCs.
It's important to know exactly what your wall segments are and which ones you're looking at in different views. This side is a pretty good screenshot if you're still learning the walls and how to identify the walls in different views, your metasophageal views, your transgastric views. There's two ways or systems that I use to remember which walls are which. In the mid-esophageal views, one of the ways that you can do it is by looking at the right side of the image. The right side of the image, whether it's four chamber, two chamber, or long axis, will always be an anterior wall. So you'll have your anterior lateral wall in the four chamber, your anterior wall in the two chamber, and then an anterior septal wall in the long axis. The other method I use, and this is more globally when I'm doing TE exams, especially when I was learning a number of years ago, is to imagine seeing the picture on the right and imagine your thumb is consistent with the right side of the TE image and is always oriented like this when the omniplane angle is zero. So just as you see here, it's essentially a TE probe going down, casting out this 2D image and your thumb will always be the right side of this image. So. Another way to look at it is in this image where your thumb is the right side, that's the zero degree angle. You can remember because you can see it's headed towards the patient's left side, and that's often where the anterior lateral wall of the LV will be located. As you change your omniplane angle, your thumb will become more vertically oriented, and that would point to where the anterior wall would be located. And then as you continue the omniplane angle towards the long axis, that's what we're pointing towards the right ventricle where the anterior septal wall would be located. So it's just a simple way as you move your omniplane angle to keep track of what would be on the right side of the image where your thumb should be pointing. Looking at a few specific examples of regional wall motion abnormalities, here's a normal image so we can have a baseline going forward to say what's normal thickening. One of the methods I use to help analyze this is to place my finger or a cursor in the middle of the left ventricle and see each wall thickening towards it. If you don't see a wall thickening towards it, that could be indicative of a regional wall motion abnormality. Let's look at some specific examples of regional wall motion abnormalities. So here, which wall is failing to move appropriately? You'll see that infralateral wall failing to move the inferior wall as well, somewhat of the lateral wall, and that's indicative of a left circumflex lesion. Let's look at the next one. Which wall is failing to move here? That inferior and inferoseptal wall not thickening hardly at all, and that points to an RCA lesion in this case. In this example, where do we see wall motion abnormalities? Which walls are not thickening? Anterior wall, the anteroseptal wall, that's indicative of an LAD lesion. So when we look at these together, it can help point you to which coronary arteries are functional, which are patent, and this is important both pre and post bypass to give you clues about graft function. What if I can't obtain gastric views like the ones we just looked at? This can happen. This actually happened to me a few weeks ago in a case that a patient had recent bleeding from their stomach, and we felt it was safest to continue the exam in the esophagus for the entire case. Two ways you can do this. One is by looking at your metasophageal views and seeing if you can identify any wall motion abnormalities or thickening abnormalities based on that. The other way you can do it is to acquire a full volume acquisition and do that 3D quantification we talked about. Remember, it shows specific segments and can identify specific wall motion abnormalities that might be present. You can also acquire a 3D data set and use your MPRs. You'll see here that blue plane, you can move up and down through different parts of the left ventricle. And whether it's in a live view where you're using multi-view, you can place it at specific parts of the left ventricle to get basal, mid-papillary, or apical views. And you'll see regional wall motion abnormalities or normal wall motion that way. Or you can do it with post-processing, use 3DQ and look at specific segments and align them exactly where you want in the L. LV. But what this lets you know is that whether you go into the stomach or not, you should be able to get adequate views of the left ventricle. So it's just another tool to have in your pocket if your patient has specific gastric pathology that would make you want to be cautious about it, or you're not able to get adequate gastric views for any sorts of reasons. As we mentioned before, post bypass, we're going to keep an eye out on any changes to global LV function or wall motion abnormalities, as these may be early indicators of graft failure, of kinking of the graft, thrombosis, and we'll do this periodically at different points in the post bypass period. That's why it's important to get good baseline assessment pre bypass so you know you have something to compare it to post bypass. Also specifically look at, at sternal closure as that's a time when graphs can kink especially.
Some of the main points I want you to take away from part one are that it's very important to look at global LV function and specifically at regional function for any wall motion abnormalities, both before bypass to get a baseline and then also after bypass because graphs can kink, they can thrombose, they can be not patent in the first place. And identifying this with echo can help point your surgeon to necessary interventions after the fact. There's still more to cover in a part two episode of TEE for cavity surgery. In this episode, we'll focus more on how to manage valvular disease while undergoing cavity surgery, and particularly how to manage moderate valvular disease. We'll also focus on post myocardial infarction, mechanical complications that can occur and what you should do about them. Thank you guys for watching. If there's something you do differently at your own institution, leave a comment, let us know so we can learn from each other. Also, if you want more of this content, hit the subscribe button, feel free to leave a review. We really do appreciate it and it does help us reach more people. So thank you guys, we'll see y'all next time.